Welcome back to our continued Bible study on the books of First and Second Samuel. We're going to be in chapter 3 of 1 Samuel here in just a moment. We thank you that you are joining with us as it's important to not only study the Word of God as a historical document, because here in First and Second Samuel, obviously we're in historical books, uh, but also seeing the correlation and the relationship that these books have with us today. And we're going to continue on with this as we learn a very important important lesson. And some people have to learn it in a very difficult fashion. And that would be Eli and his sons as God rejects them, as God disowns them, if you will, as the priests in charge, placing in their place, in their in their spot, uh, he gives Samuel. Now Samuel is uh, the opposite side. What are we going to learn today, the key theme? And I want to encourage you to, to download that study guide that's online with this Bible study right now. But the key theme that we're going to be looking at today is that the Lord honors those who honor him and rejects those who, do, who disregard or reject him. We have to be very careful in our continued relationship. Today in the church around the world, it is very common, very popular to think that once you are saved, you are always saved. That once you start a relationship with God, it's there forever. The problem with that concept and what we're going to be looking at today is that when we are obstinate, when we disown God, when as he uses the term God does to blast blaspheme him, turning our backs on God and rejecting him, we end up in a very bad situation. Matter of fact, last week we talked a little bit about this as Eli came and addressed his sons and he said, sons, what you are doing is not right. If somebody sins against God, there is nobody to plead their case. In other words, when we set ourselves up as uh, opponents or enemies of God, we end up in a situation where there are no recourses for us. Jesus also highlights this, uh, this idea as he talks about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit being the only sin that is without forgiveness, without pardon. I'm not going to go into a great deal of time explaining what that is, but we as a people need to make sure that we stay true, stay steadfast to the Lord. So let's go to our text this afternoon and uh, or morning, depending on when you're seeing this video, it's afternoon as I'm recording it right now. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 3, let's go ahead and read that chapter and then we're going to analyze and see what it is speaking to us. It's an encouraging chapter as God begins his interaction, begins his communication with Samuel and Samuel is learning to hear God's voice. Now I don't know if you've ever been in that situation where at the very beginning of your relationship with God, you're thinking, how is it that I can hear God's voice? How is it that I know what his voice sounds like? Well, you're not the only one. Here we're going to see in this chapter that Samuel as well at the beginning doesn't quite understand how to discern whether it's God's voice or some other person's voice. But we're going to see some of the keys that he's able to implement in order to learn the voice of God and then later walk in obedience. It does us no good whatsoever to hear hear God's voice if we're not willing to put it into practice, if we're not willing to walk in obedience. So let's go to chapter 3, verse 1. It says, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. We'll go back to it in just a moment. But notice, he's ministering, but he doesn't even know what God's voice sounds like. We'll get there. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant 
is listening. So Samuel went, went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning, and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision, but Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, Here am I. Or here I am. What was it that he said to you, Eli asked? Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, He is a Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And so if you look at this, the first two callings, if you will, nobody understands what's going on. Now, we need to understand, it says that in those days, the visions or the word of the Lord was rare. Now, that means that even Eli, now being old, now being in a situation where his eyesight is failing, and it's an interesting correlation that he had no spiritual vision, not enough withstanding to, to, to be able to correct and rebuke and put into place, or restrain is the word that we just read, his own sons. He didn't remove them as the high priest. He should have removed them from their office. He didn't have the necessary vision spiritually. And here we see that it's reflected in the physical as well. It doesn't always go that way. You may be a person who can't see in the physical, but have great vision spiritually. You may be a person who sees perfectly uh, in the physical and sees nothing in the spiritual. They're not necessarily correlated, but it's interesting here in this text that we see them in correlation. But we find here that Samuel is lying down in the house of the Lord. And it gives us the impression, and it says, lying down in his usual place, Eli, but also it appears to be the same type of context for Samuel. What do we have? We have Eli lying down in his usual place, which obviously is not right there next to the Ark of the Lord, isn't right there in the presence of the Lord, because uh, in a po opposition or in another location, we have Samuel uh, who is laying there, and he has to go to Eli. And it says here that in that day, it was happening, and it was before the, the lamp of the Lord had gone out. Well, what does that mean? You see, according to the scripture, the lamps of the Lord had to be lit at sunset and stay burning all the way until morning or until sunrise. And so they would know how much oil was required to make that time frame happen. As we are right now in the northern hemisphere, in winter months, we have longer nights than we do days, and it goes opposite during the summer months. And so they would know how much and how long that lamp had to burn. And it was before sunrise sunrise. So what we're going to say here is that this young boy, because that's how it starts off, the boy Samuel ministered. This young boy is laying down here next to the ark in the place where God's presence is supposed to dwell, although they haven't really perceived his presence for a long period of time because visions and words from the Lord were very rare. And there he is lying down and somewhere before dawn. Somewhere before, when, when there's still that phase of sleepiness, if you will, Samuel is sound asleep, and we could also assume that Eli is sound asleep. 
Now you can imagine things like this happen on occasion with young children. For example, if you are a parent of a young child, you may have seen this happen even at Christmas. Christmas morning seems to come earlier and earlier the more the child is aware of what's going on until they become a teenager and then they aren't so excited about it. But there's times when families are woken up at 4 o'clock and 5 o'clock in the morning by children who never get up so early. And this is kind of the impression that we have here that all of a sudden God comes just before dawn, before the lamp of the Lord would go out, before there's other light and it's just this light flickering there in the presence of God. And God says, Samuel. And what's the response? This is interesting because this is a key element to the teaching that we have here. Because Samuel's first response is he's ready to obey. He's woken from a sleep. And according to what we see here, it says in verse 4, Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli. Now, what kind of kid is this? And when they call, when even Eli, if I were to call a ch- my child in the, in the early morning before they're completely awake, they would stir a little bit and say, I don't think I heard anybody's voice. Maybe I did. I think I was dreaming it. But no, Samuel has this obedience already a part of his character. And immediately he jumps to his feet and he runs to Eli. Now, this may be part and parcel with the fact that Eli's eyes eyesight is failing and his own sons are are, are treating the the, the work of the Lord with contempt and blaspheming against the Lord. They aren't there. They're not attending to his need. It's it's interesting to me to see how children respond to their parents' needs. If you have a parent who has a disability and uh, mentioning, I remember when when my nephew growing up, uh, he would try to help his father because my brother is in a wheelchair, a Later on, he kind of got out of that phase, I think, a little bit. Uh, But nonetheless, when we see a need, we can rise to that occasion. And perhaps that's what happens here in Samuel's life. He notices that Eli can't see. He's having difficulty with the general aspects of life. It's before light. Uh, Perhaps Eli would typically call saying, I need help to light a lamp. I can't see where I'm going. I can't see what's going on. Because after all, Eli was going blind in the moment moment. And so Samuel jumps to his feet in the in early morning before sunrise and runs to Eli and he says, here I am. Samuel is a person who is obedient. He's a person who understands that obedience is needed. And as he responds in obedience, we discover something. We as believers also have to be people who walk in obedience. Samuel's ready to obey. But if we look through the whole of the Old Testament and even into the New Testament, we discover the fact that God blesses the obedient. Now, in fact, Jesus tells us in John 14 that if you you love him, you will obey his commands. We are blessed because God says that person genuinely loves me as we walk in obedience. Let me read some scripture for you. In Genesis 22, we have the story of Abraham. Now remember, Abraham has God show up and God is about to tell him, I want you to sacrifice for me your one and only son. So let's read in verse 1 of Genesis 22. It says, so Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and notice the response, here I am. The same exact response that Samuel gives. So he says, here I am, he replied. And then later on in the same chapter, we have the same thing happening again. As, as, as Abraham is about ready to sacrifice his son Isaac. And there it says in verse 11, But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, to stop the knife in mid-swing, if you will. And what does it say? Here I am, he replied. So we see God blessing the obedient. We go into the example of Jacob in Genesis 31 and verse 11. It says, the angel of the Lord said to me in the dream, Jacob, I answered, here I am. God speaking and the response isn't 
call me later, isn't I'm busy right now, isn't let me finish my own tasks, but these are responding, here I am. If we go in, we can look at uh, Joseph, for example, or, or even uh, others, but Joseph in Genesis 37 and verse 13, it says, And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. That term, very well, is actually the same term that later on, or earlier and later on, they're they're translating, here I am. Joseph is basically saying, I'm willing to do whatever you need me to do. Here I am, very well, that's fine. And that is a person who's obedient, and God obviously blesses Joseph, who's later going to become second in charge like Pharaoh of all of Egypt, blessing his family because the blessings of God are upon him. Moses, we have another story in Exodus 3 and verse 4. It says, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And what's Moses' response? He says, and Moses said, here I am. I'm listening, God. Give me your orders. I'm willing and ready to obey. So the Lord moves upon us as we are willing to obey. We have to be willing to get up. We have to be willing to do what God is calling us to do. Now, if you notice here, Samuel isn't saying this to God. He's saying this to Eli. Very important. Samuel had already learned to submit and obey to his authority. Before we could ever expect to obey other authorities, and that's why God gives us uh, parents, God gives us teachers, God gives us all of these influences and leaders in our lives as we're growing up, because before we could ever learn to submit and obey God's voice, we have to learn how to submit and obey authority, period. Paul also mentions it to the Romans that we have to submit to governing authorities, that we have to be willing to obey others. And so here, Samuel doesn't know that it's God yet, hasn't discovered what God's voice sounds like, but he jumps up and he goes, and I can imagine this elderly guy named Eli being shaken as Samuel gets there and says, what do you want? I'm, you called me, here I am. And Eli rolls over and says, Oh, son, you must have been having a dream. Go back and lie down. It's too early. The sun's not even up. We're not ready to go yet today. And so Samuel goes back, gets back into his, his uh, bedding and however that would be there in the, in, the te- in the area where the ark of God was. And he lies down and, and perhaps just as he's dozing off once again, he hears Samuel. And once again, Samuel jumps to his feet, assuming it's Eli. Who else would be calling him? And he knows that Eli needs his help. And so he runs to Eli and gets Eli aroused again from his slumber. And Eli again says, Samuel, I'm not calling you. Go back and lie down. Just, you're having dreams. I don't know what's going on, but just go back and lie down. So again, Samuel goes back to lie down. See, it's interesting here. This aged priest who should have had an ear attuned to what God was saying, what God was doing, the word of God was rare because of disobedience. Because he permitted disobedience in his children's life. And then when he was corrected by the man of God in the previous chapter, chapter 2, he did not correct his son. So that means that he also was walking in disobedience. He didn't respond to the voice of God. So Eli at this point doesn't know it's God speaking either. But Eli does have an advantage. He's older. He's seen a few more things. He can come to a few more conclusions. While Samuel is assuming that his leader is the one speaking, Eli, being the leader, says, wait a second, somebody else is speaking here. So when the third time comes and Samuel comes running into his room and he says, here I am, what's the response? Eli says, I'm not calling you. I think it's God calling you. The next time you hear that voice, if he comes back again, what I want you to do is simply say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Now, the Lord here then comes to Samuel and he speaks to Samuel and Samuel says, here am I, here I am. I'm transferring my leadership, my my leader, my, my allegiance from Eli to you because my leader told me to do that. I am submitted to my leader until that point. 
important point for us to remember, that we are faithful. God honors faithfulness. As I said at the very beginning, one of the key themes that we're focusing on here in this study is that the Lord honors those who honor him. Another way of talking about honoring is somebody that is faithful. Now, we understand that God is always faithful. Matter of fact, Paul tells Timothy that if we are faithless, he remains faithful because he can't disown himself. That's who he is. God is always honoring, always faithful. But these are synonymous terms in this aspect, that we are faithful honoring God in everything. So God repeats the message that Eli had already received. You see, God is now putting through this scripture, chapter 3, he's raising up Samuel. In chapter 2, we just have this guy show up, and in verse 27 it says, a man of God. A man of God, a prophet, if you will, shows up and tells Eli. Eli accepts it. Eli acknowledges it. Eli says, this is the word of God. And now what we have is what appears to be a time when Samuel had never heard about the man of God showing up. He's already a boy. Now, what older person is going to come to the boy? And this may have been a day earlier. It could have been years earlier. We don't know. But who, as an adult and the aged one, the leader, comes and pours out their heart to a little kid and says, oh, God's going to punish me and so forth. So likely is that Samuel has never heard this message. But God is giving Samuel a message with a key element. He's going to tell him the exact same thing that Eli has already heard. And why would he do that? Because God wants to confirm his word. As we begin to learn and get our spiritual ears attuned to what God is saying, at the beginning of those stages, we can feel very confused, unsure, unsteady, if you will, saying, I'm not sure if this is God or somebody else. I don't know if it's my own emotion or the Spirit, the Holy Spirit speaking to me, but I feel this is happening. And at the beginning, God will give us some very clear confirmation because he wants us to hear his voice. He wants us as his people to know who he is and to be able to walk in obedience. And so here the Lord speaks and he says, I've already given this message and we know that this message was already heard. So there is no indication that Samuel has heard the message before, but its repetition causes two things. Number one, it confirms to Samuel that he can hear from God. But also it confirms to Eli that God's decision is final, that it cannot be changed. It's not going to be twisted around. You see, Eli's sons were without excuse. Here in chapter 3 and verse 13, it says, For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God and he failed to restrain them. God tells Samuel, so that Eli already knew this. I told him that I would judge his family, and he did nothing. Now, we don't know how long God gave Eli to respond, but obviously at this point, the second encounter, God is saying, I told him there was no response. He did nothing to restrain them, to cause them to be removed from office, and now this is a completely final decision. You know why this is so important is because the priests working there in the temple, in this case, Eli's sons, it says they blasphemed God. According to the law, cursing God is a capital offense. If you go to the book of Leviticus chapter 24, you have this long list of the requirements of sacrifices in the priests and so forth. And anybody that blasphemed God, it was a capital offense. This was somebody that was going to be treated without mercy and was going to be killed on the spot. So Eli here comes to Samuel. And I don't know if Eli is just curious. If Eli genuinely is, is wondering what the Lord has said, or if he knows that it's the same thing and it's a process of con confirmation for Samuel. But all we know is that Samuel wakes up having been given this message as a young boy. Could you imagine? He's never heard the voice of God before. And God has told him this. And he gets up and he opens the doors. And what it says here 
In verse 15, Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Now here's the, the third step in learning to hear the voice of God. Number one, we have to be submitted to authority. Number two, we have to be willing to hear that message and obey it. Number three, we have to conquer our own fears. Every time God speaks to us, telling us to do something, there's going to be a natural response of fear. People will ridicule me. I don't have the resources necessary to complete the task that God is calling me to do. We may have a mountain of things that we could state, but the reality is, is that fear will always be there. And so while it says that he was afraid to tell Eli, but Eli comes in. And this is a key point, a key turn in the life of Samuel. Because later on, I'm going to ask, why is it that God is blessing Samuel? And we're going to have to answer that question. But at this point, Samuel is afraid and Eli comes and says, tell me. Now, there's a lot of people who will tell only half the story. Tell only the good part. Oh, yeah, he spoke to me. And I know God's voice now. We're leaving out the details that could offend somebody. We have stories around the world of churches where key members were in sin. And because they were key members, the pastor didn't confront them, much like Eli didn't confront his particular sons. And then later on, would candy coat it, not give all of the information, and not call it sin, not call what it is really before God. But this is not going to be the case with Samuel. It says here very clearly, but Eli called called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, here I am. What was it? He said to you, Eli asked, do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely. If you hide from me anything, he told you. Hide no detail. Tell me the full extent of God's anger against me. Obviously, Eli would know that there's something up here. Because Eli being the authority, if God had a word to tell to the rest of the community, he would be the one to receive the word. But when Eli's the one that is going to be reprimanded, he understands that would mean that God has to speak to somebody else. And so he comes and he says, tell it to me. And he'd already heard it. He already knew from the man of God earlier in chapter 2. And so it says in verse 18, so Samuel told him and notice this word, everything, hiding nothing from him. Samuel gets an opportunity to hear from God because of the faithfulness of his mother, if you will. Now, I will never talk about and preach on uh, as though it's a fact for today, generational curses out there. Because God clearly tells us in the book of Jeremiah that everyone will pay for their own sins. It used to be said that the fathers and the grandparents ate sour grapes and the children's teeth were turned on edge, Jeremiah is told. But this will be no more because everyone will pay for their own sins. Now that's the case with the, with the curses. In the Old Testament, when God is introducing the idea of blessing and cursing, God says that he's a God that holds and curses those who curse him to the third and fourth generation, but the blessings go for a thousand generations. I don't believe, and there's no scriptural background to tell us that we may be a part of a generational curse. Every one of us are responsible for our own lives, our own ability to obey God. But here we have something interesting because Hannah pleads with God. And we talked about this in the very first week of the book of Samuel in our study here. As Hannah pours out her heart before God with all of the surrounding area and even her own people, the Israelites, having a tendency to go to this fertility God and go to Baal and go to these others and seek somebody else. Hannah says, no, I am faithful. I am honoring the one who deserves honor. And as a result, God takes this young boy before he would ever be considered of age to do something important. This young boy, and he says, I'm going to put my word upon him and see what happens. And then after that initial encounter, because of Hannah's faithfulness, he gets the opportunity. God also will give us opportunity, even if we don't have a parent. 
or a grandparent or a great-grandparent that sowed that into us. God gives us the opportunity. And then, and then uh, Samuel is able to obey and respond. And he says, so Samuel told him everything. And here we have in verse 18 at the end, then Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. Eli, you see, in chapter 2 and verse 25, had already been informed of this, and he had already told his sons that if we sin against God, there's nobody who's going to be our advocate. Because God being against us means that nobody is set up. Any sin that we may have in our lives, Jesus always lives to intercede for us. But if we set ourselves up as obstinate, as people disobedient to God, as people who blaspheme God, turn our backs on God, then God is against us. This is the theme that's repeated here over and over again. So the Lord was with Samuel, and he was not with the household of Eli. In verse 19, it says, the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up. Here we have the transition. And if you will, it's a, it's a minor shadowing of what's going to happen later on as God initially raises up Saul as the king and he then turns his back. And as he turns his back on Eli and his family to put his face shining upon Samuel, God will turn his back on Saul and he cannot hear from God. God doesn't answer him at the very end of Saul's life. Matter of fact, he goes to a medium and he goes to a false sense of hope or restoration and God brings a quick end to his life to establish this new in the person of David. And so we have this happening in a minor scale here with Samuel as he takes the place of leadership instead of Eli and his family. And it says, the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And it's interesting how it says here in this verse 19, the Lord was with Samuel. Let me give you a word of encouragement. The one thing that we need as believers is that the Lord be with us. The Lord be with us. If you will, let's go into some of the texts of the Old Testament. We have people like in Isaac's case, in Genesis 26 and verse 3. It says, stay in this land for a while and I will be with you and will bless you. When God is with us, we open our lives up to his blessings. Now, we don't obey him just so that he would pour out material blessings upon us. But God can bless us while we walk in his presence. And that's what he says. He says, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you, for to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. You see, being with the God, walking with God, is not only a, si a, a signal that implies a relationship, but also a blessing. We have a guy earlier in this moment even, a guy named Enoch, and he walked with God, and all of a sudden was no more, because God took him. This is the context that we have here, this phrase, being with God. Jacob also was with God. In Genesis 31 and verse 3, it says, Then the Lord said to Jacob, Go back to the land of your fathers and your relatives, and I will be with you. The promise? Why was that needed? Because back home, his brother was ready to kill him. But God says, I am going to be with you if you go. To Moses, he said in Exodus 3 and verse 12, and God said, I will give, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who, will, who have sinned you. When you brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship on this mountain. And then later on in chapter 33, remember the presence of God had grown to be so important for Moses. They, Moses says to God, God, you are telling me to lead these people, but you haven't said who's going to go with me. You know what, God? Moses, I'm paraphrasing, says, if you don't go, I'm not going to go. How will anyone know that we are your chosen people if your presence isn't with us? 
God had said that these are stiff-necked people. I couldn't go with them. If my presence were with them for even a day, I would destroy them. But Moses has grown accustomed, recognizes that the presence of God upon his life, the presence of walking in God's presence day by day was something that was so important that he would rather that than to go into the promised land. He'd rather live in the desert in the presence of God than in the promised land. And so God's response there in Exodus 33 and 14 says, The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. He also promised to Joshua. Joshua was in charge of going in and waging war. And we often don't think of war as this thing that requires the blessings or the presence of God because God is holy and he wouldn't be a part of the bloodshed. But notice what it says in Joshua 1 and verse 5. It says, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life as I was with Moses so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. We will always have God's presence with us. We'll get there in just a moment. Also, Gideon is given the same instruction. In Judges 6, verse 16, the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down the Midianites, leaving none alive. These are key elements, but we also have moments of great caution. Is, for example, in the life of Samson. Remember, we, st- we talked about a little of the foreshadowing that Samuel has with Samson and how his introduction co- correlates with the introduction of the prior judge. But Samson had, this, had it rejoiced in or uh, enjoyed the presence of God all of his life. From birth, he had had these promises before God and God's presence was with him. But when that last promise was broken... When he does not honor God, the response is that God's presence withdrew from him. And when Delilah cries out to Samson, saying, Samson, your enemies are upon you, he rose thinking, I will be able to destroy them just as before. And there is probably the saddest verse in the whole of the Bible is when it says, for he did not know or he was unaware that the presence of the Lord had left him. Can you imagine the greatest blessing of your life being that God's presence is with you? You've learned to hear his voice and you're walking in his presence day by day and to get to a place where you don't even know when his presence is left. But it can. So we need to be very careful because Jesus gave us a promise, a promise of his presence. Just as here in verse 19 of 1 Samuel 3, the Lord was with Samuel, Jesus promises to be with us. At the very end of the book of Matthew, chapter 28, and verse 20, it says, uh, part of the Great Commission, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And it says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The blessing that is the presence of God is ours, church, as we walk in his likeness, as we walk in obedience to him. Notice the correlation here of this verse. Jesus says, and I'm going to be with you, but it's conditional. We talked a little bit about conditional promises last week. Because Jesus comes to his disciples and says, go, make disciples of all nations. And then we read the last part, baptizing the name, the na- them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. When we walk in obedience, doing what God is telling, as Samuel here walks in obedience, doing what God has told him, he hears from God, he's learned his voice, he's learned to say, here am I, I'm going to be obedient. He's learned to fight his fears and to obey and give the whole of the word of God rather than just the portion that he thinks or perceives the person may want to hear or enjoy as he walks out all of these details of being an obedient person he enjoys the fact that the Lord is with Samuel, same with us. As we walk out God's commands, as we walk in his presence, we can also say that God's presence is upon us. And it says here, and he grew up and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. For such failure, having his words fail, would mean that his authority, Samuel's authority as prophet of God would be questioned. Why? Let me read for you out of Deuteronomy 18. It says in verse 17 and following, the Lord said to me, 
what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name, anything I have have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods is to be put to death. You know, I'll tell you, and this is just in a little a little aside, we have people, Christians, namely in the United States, excuse me, but that's where I, I see it happening, who stood up and were prophesying certain things about a second term for President Trump, a certain things about uh, uh, political issues, and then it didn't happen. What does God say about that? Later on, I saw one person actually say that God uh, is now in a phase where he says it's okay to be a false prophet. Uh, I mean, I don't know how far away you can get. If we're walking in the presence of God, it is not okay to be a false prophet. Only those who want to say what other people want them to he- want to hear can be considered a false prophet. If Samuel, in this case, had given to Eli only the things that Eli would like to hear, then he would have been a false prophet. He would have heard something from God, but had not given the full details. And so God says that person would be put to death because he's holding back. He's using his own emotion, his own worries, his own self-preservation instinct to be able to protect him, not thinking that I am with him and I can bless him and I can protect him. So in verse 21, it says, you may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously, so do not be alarmed. You can disregard what that particular prophet is saying. Even if they call themselves a prophet, even if they've been successful in predicting the future in the past, they're a false prophet. Uh, And so it says here, and so all, in verse 20, all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. And what does that mean? When you say, Dan, that's like saying to the extreme north. If you will, if you're in the United States, it would mean like saying from Canada to Mexico. Or if you're here where we are in Mexico, it would be like saying from the United States to to Belize and Guatemala. Uh, Everyone is able to hear and recognize that this is something that takes place. And they receive the prophetic message of God. Because the next chapter, we didn't read it, but that first part says and Samuel's word came to all Israel and so we have this continued walk before God the Lord continues to reveal himself to Samuel as Sheol and it says the the Lord appeared to him as Sheol and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. Samuel continued to hear. We are not to be content with only a taste and only have heard the word of God once or on occasion, as it says the beginning of this chapter, that it was rare, but rather we are called to be people, children of God, who walk in his presence daily. So what do we learn from this chapter? One, that the Lord is willing to renew his relationship with his covenant community through those who honor him. You don't look to renew a relationship with God through a false prophet. Don't look to renew a relationship with God through somebody who's only trying to tell you what you want to hear. Because there's a day when people will be crying out and their itching ears are longing to hear something. And I believe we're in that phase. And there's going to be a mountain of teachers saying those things. Those are not the people who will lead us back into a relationship with God. But we need to be under those people who are honoring God. Because God honors those who honor Honor him, and God rejects those who dishonor him. In Samuel's time, the Lord renews his relationship by once again providing prophetic revelation, guiding very specifically the nation of Israel into God's presence. You know, it's vital that we as believers also do this. We have to move forward. When the covenant community is alienated from God, the very first thing that has to take place is repentance. If you have walked away from God, 
You can't just go back and say, okay, I want to be here once again. No, one of the things that we need to learn and we need to recognize is the value of repentance. Turning away from. That's the first step. And then we can walk in relationship with him because God respects, God blesses those who are walking in relationship with him because the Lord honors those who honor him. In this pronounced judgment that we see here on the household of Eli, the Lord declares very clearly in the previous chapter, let me read for you what it says in verse 30. And it says here, Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promised that your I promised that your members of your family would minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, Far be it from me. Those who honor me, I will honor. But those who despise me will be disdained. We have to be careful that we aren't those people because they were also around in the days of Jesus. Jesus warned the religious leaders of his day that this could be taking place. Look at what it says here in Mark chapter 7 and verse 6. It says, he replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. The people who were supposed to have the word of God, but they were only painting it for themselves. to look better and feel better about themselves. There was no repentance. There was no genuine relationship with God. And the presence of God was far from them. And what does it say as we read on? As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. God is not looking for lip service, but obedience. God is not looking for people who will say the right things amongst the people who want to hear the right things, but rather people who live out the right life. And this is the situation with Samuel. He's put to the test at the very beginning. As a young boy, Eli comes and he's trembling, I could imagine, because it says that he was afraid. He didn't want to share what God had told him. But Eli comes and says, I'm going to tell you, you need to share everything with me. And if you don't share everything with me, then God will treat you so severely. Severely. And so what's the response? Samuel quickly summarizes it. He says, I have to do everything. I have to obey completely. And so it's not about lip service. It's about obedience. It's about loyalty to God. Here was the promise from God in Second Chronicles 16 and verse 9. It says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those, who, those whose hearts are fully committed to Him, those who are loyal, those who are honoring Him. God is still looking for those people. You and I can be those people because Jesus still wants to be with us to the very end of the age, supporting and strengthening the efforts of evangelism and worldwide missions. Jesus still wants to be glorified and honored, but he's going to be glorified and honored by people who glorify and honor him. Not people who live their own lives and then put on a show to be able to receive the offerings or receive the accolades that the world would have to offer. No, we have to honor. Jesus also says in John 5, 23, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. We can't differentiate. We can't say one is better than the other. We have to honor the Father because you can't honor the Father without honoring the Son. We give reverence to the moving of the Holy Spirit. We cannot quench the Holy Spirit because if we talk over the top of the Holy Spirit in our service, is what's going to happen as a result we have been quenching we've been dishonoring if that were the case and that means that we aren't walking in the blessings because we are dishonoring god we honor the lord through our actions not just through our words (coughs) excuse me in first corinthians paul goes into great detail talking about sexual immorality. You say, why would you bring this up? Because look at the context of what he places honoring the Lord. Let's read the scripture. It says in 1 Corinthians 6, 12 to 20, it says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and stomach for the food. And God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. Paul here is saying that your body, and he's going to say it, honors the Lord. So make sure you honor God with your body, with what you do, think, say, where your eyes look. He says, 
The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and will raise us also. Jesus lives inside of us. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with the prostitute? Never! Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. So he goes on in verse 18. Flee from sexual morality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. So you do not know... Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. And notice how he summarizes it. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Everywhere we go, everything we do, who we are is meant to honor God. In 2 Corinthians, in chapter 8, and verse 19, it says, What is more, he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering. So what am I saying? An offering honors him. We don't come to church and say, I wonder how much money I have in my wallet right now. Or contemplate what we have left over. God is not a beggar on the street looking at what we have left over. He's not like Lazarus in the story uh, that Jesus told the parable of the rich man and Lazarus who was begging for just the, the crumbs that fell from the master's table. That's not the God we have. What he says here, Paul, he says, which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself and to show our eagerness to help. As we give an offering, that offering is not counted in in dollars, in pesos. That offering is not counted in the way that the world counts money, but rather God says that's honoring to me. That's why Jesus could look at a widow and say she gave more than everyone else because God's accounting method doesn't go along with the sense. Doesn't count, uh, isn't on a spreadsheet, but rather on an honor scale. I've honored God with all that I have. And so we as people in God's presence, we move day by day. What are we learning here out of 1 Samuel chapter 3? We learn the same lessons today that Samuel had to learn. We have to learn what God's voice sounds like. We have to learn to obey God. We have to learn to not candy coat what God says and give all of the word of God, breaking away from our own fear. We have learned to speak forth and honor God with all of our lives as God is able to honor his word that comes through Samuel as Samuel walks in integrity. Now later on, we're going to get to a place where the nation is asking for a king because his son aren't following in his pattern every one of us no matter if we are a righteous person or a wicked person the next generation has to decide for themselves now we have to be people that decide right now for ourselves we are going to honor god with everything that we have so i want to close with a word of prayer with you i want to encourage you be a person that honors god honors god with your thoughts honors god with your body honors god with your finances honors god with everything that you are because those who honor god we have a promise god will honor and those who dishonor god god will disown so let's go with to the lord with a word of prayer father thank you for encouraging your church to not be those who candy coat the message, to not have an easy believism, that never talk about repentance, that never talk about sin. Samuel, at even a very early age, had to confront a very difficult situation, which was going to eliminate his past leader. As he had moved into having a new leader in you, we do the same thing, God. We submit ourselves to you and we give you permission to speak the whole of your gospel through us.
Let us be people who honor you, taking your gospel, the whole of the gospel, all around the world as you commanded us, Jesus, in Matthew 28, because we want that promise. We, like Moses, say, if your presence doesn't go, we're not going to go. But you have given us already your promise that as we go to make disciples, as we go teaching, as we go preaching your message, you will always be with us. And so, Lord, we want to be those people who enjoy the fact that your presence is upon us and you guide and speak to our hearts moment by moment, day by day. We pray it in your name, Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week as we continue our Bible study on 1 Samuel.